Revival has recently happened at Asbury University in Kentucky and also at several other universities in the United States. The whole concept of a revival is new to some, but in reality, the idea and the practice of revival have been around for a long time. Hi, I'm Professor Wendy. Welcome to Cool Seminary Tutorials. In this video, we'll take a brief look at, first, what is revival? And second, what is the broader concept of revivalism? And third, how have these played out in modern history in North America? We'll explore how revival and revivalism have impacted countless lives, almost certainly lives of people you and I know, and maybe even your own. First, what is revival? The most basic meaning is, quote, coming back to life or consciousness, end quote. In the religious sense, which certainly includes the recent revivals on university campuses, this would mean coming back to a spiritual life or awareness of the reality and presence of God in one's life. First of all, the word revival has historically been associated with evangelistic preaching aimed at converting people to life-changing faith in Jesus Christ. In this way, awakening them to the reality and presence of God and what this can mean personally. Revivals have often prompted people to confess their sins publicly and to accept Jesus Christ as their personal divine Savior. Second, moving to a definition of revivalism, it is belief in or promotion of revivals, especially on a large scale to bring about renewal and new life to whole churches or even to society itself by building or restoring connections between people and God. Let's take a brief look at the root of the words revival and revivalism. The root word for both is revive. In the Bible's Old Testament, we can find the Hebrew word for revive used nine times, each one associated with the meaning of, quote, to live, to keep, or make alive, end quote. In the New Testament, it's used twice in Paul's letter to the Romans, once having to do with sin reasserting itself in Paul's life, and in Romans 14, 9, referring to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who, quote, died and lived again, End quote. We can definitely see a pattern of the meaning of revive in the Bible that is repeated in the history of Christianity. The words revive, revival, and revivalism all have to do with restoring life where it has been lost or ended, declined, or withered away. We can find seasons of revival throughout the history of Christianity. In this video, however, we will focus on several major instances of revivalism in North America. The most famous large-scale examples of revivalism in North America are commonly known as the First and Second Great Awakenings. Let's take a look at the First Great Awakening, which featured famous 18th century preachers such as Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, and brothers John and Charles Wesley, as well as lesser-known leaders. One of the earliest well-known revivalists in North America was Jonathan Edwards. He preached a series of sermons in his Massachusetts parish way back in the 1730s. Afterwards, he published a little book called, quote, A Faithful Narrative of the Surprising Work of God in the Conversion of Many Hundred Souls in Northampton, and the neighboring towns and villages. Notice his language spoke of the revival as, quote, the surprising work of God, end quote. Although preachers were required to preach, they generally, humbly, attributed any positive outcome of their preaching to the work of God, and Edwards was no exception. Edwards' publication not only reported upon the revival that took place by the power of God in the hearers' lives in response to his preaching, it also served as a model for subsequent revivals, and 
It connected Edwards with other preachers who hoped for similar outcomes, like George Whitfield and the Wesley brothers. So next, let's look at George Whitfield, who became known as one of the greatest ever revival preachers in America. Born in England and a friend of the Wesleys, in the 1730s and 40s, he introduced outdoor preaching and directed his messages to all who would listen, including those not usually welcomed in the wealthy or established churches. Whitfield preached for a response from each person to make a choice for or against God, as he believed no one possessed the ability to save himself or herself from sin, regardless of social status. This style of preaching to the masses took the gospel throughout the colonies in North America, from the wealthiest to those who had been enslaved. It has been said that the resulting Great Awakening, which lasted through the 1780s, was the first truly national event in America, and it helped to unite the disparate settlers in the various colonies in a common culture that in 1776 became a new nation. Third, John and Charles Wesley were the most prominent leaders of the same awakening in England, Ireland, and Scotland. They had begun Methodism as a revival movement within the Church of England. Following the pattern set by their friend George Whitfield, they invited all who would hear to accept a life-changing relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Methodism spread quickly through the British colonies and North America, with its membership soon becoming the largest Christian presence in 19th century United States, followed closely by the Baptists. Converts came from every walk of life, including many Africans held in bondage of slavery, some of whom became revival preachers themselves. Now let's take a look at the Second Great Awakening, which took place from about 1795 to 1810, with a variety of expressions. Christianity had been in decline following the upheaval of the American Revolution, with many questioning the reality of the supernatural. Preachers traveling on horseback through the frontier, however, such as Francis Asbury, continued to pray and work for the conversion of sinners to Christ as Savior. Then a large-scale multi-denominational camp meeting in 1801 at Cane Ridge, Kentucky, offered several days of intense evangelistic meetings aimed at converting attendees to faith in Christ. This revival became a model for camp meetings throughout the young nation, first among Presbyterians, but then even more so among Methodists and Baptists. A word about camp meetings. In the early years of the new nation, many settlers lived on isolated farms and in remote cabins on the frontier. Many persons had no access to churches, sacraments, or social gatherings. Camp meetings brought religion to these settings. They were huge outdoor gatherings on the frontier, in fields or forests, where families and neighbors would come for a week or so to hear multiple preachers preach, to sing hymns, celebrate baptisms, and pray and work for more conversions to Christ. The Second Great Awakening essentially began in the context of camp meetings. Camp meetings emphasized the God-given ability for all persons to come to Christ and to become more Christ-like, but also to participate in building a godly society and nation. As a result, many large-scale, long-lasting missionary and social reform organizations were founded in the early 19th century, to take the gospel of Jesus Christ and its impact throughout the nation and the world. Some examples are the American Board of Foreign Missions in 1810, the American Bible Society, founded in 1816, the American Sunday School Union, founded in 1824, and the American Education Society, 1826, to name just a few. Women as well as men participated in the Second Great Awakening, with women's missionary associations often providing key financial support for revivals and doing much of the preparation for hosting them. The involvement of women in the revivals also translated into the formation of numerous voluntary associations to help achieve monumental social changes, including 
prohibition of alcohol at a time when alcoholism was rampant, and the promotion of voting rights. One of the best-known preachers of the Second Great Awakening was Charles Finney, who introduced new methods in planning for and carrying out revivals. Finney's new methods consisted of adoption of the anxious bench and the protracted meeting to encourage repentance and conversion to Christ. The anxious bench was an area near the front of the gathering where members of the audience would come for intensive admonition about the state of their souls, which frequently led to their conversion. The protracted meeting was a series of evening revival services that would continue for several weeks at a time in a given location. These new measures yielded impressive result, which Finney, like revivalists before him, attributed to the work of God. Phoebe Palmer, a Methodist evangelist, theologian, and author, also became well known in this period with her emphasis on Christian holiness. Building on the Methodist understanding of sanctification and her own life experience, Palmer called sinners to place their lives on God's altar and accept God's gifts not only of conversion to Christ, but also the gift of holiness, of heart, and life. Another well-known evangelist, Dwight L. Moody, led a new wave of large-scale revivals beginning in 1875. Moody's revivals were undergirded by business techniques for planning, preparation, and financial accountability. He brought revivalism to urban locations where they took place in large auditoriums. He introduced large choirs, trained ushers, an inquiry room in place of an anxious bench, and a song leader, Ira D. Sankey, to the more conventional revival methods. Moody believed God could and would work through new means at the revivalists' disposal to bring the multitudes to Christ. By 1900, Billy Sunday was employing teams of evangelists in tabernacle-like settings, and in 1906, the Azusa Street Revival in Los Angeles, California, led by African-American evangelist William Seymour, encompassed both blacks and whites in an era known in America for strict racial segregation. In the 1950s, Billy Graham added electronics to revival methods, he used microphones, television, and radio broadcasts, movies, and syndicated newspaper columns to enhance the reach of his revivals, all of which he, too, attributed to the work of God. Beyond these more famous names, countless lesser-known preachers have led revivals throughout North America and the world on a continuing basis. In many church settings in the 19th and 20th centuries, it became an established practice to host annual revival meetings at local congregations in the summer and fall. The goal of these revivals, as before, was to introduce non-believers to the gospel of Jesus Christ and to reawaken backsliders to the faith and, in both cases, restore lost relationships between people and God. Each season of revival has had in common this connecting or reconnecting people with God. But revival and revivalism have actually looked a little different in each context where they've occurred. The recent revivals on university campuses look different from the frontier camp meetings of the 19th century or John Wesley's preaching to the masses of coal miners in the fields of England or, for that matter, the countless revivals that have taken place in past decades down to the present in Africa and Asia and elsewhere. In all these revivals, there is a sweet, sweet spirit of God's presence and the opportunity for all who are present to soak in the gifts of God's presence and the gift of eternal salvation through Jesus Christ. It's always up to each participant to make of this what they will, God helping them, and to decide whether or how to let this encounter touch and change them at that moment, and maybe even forever. <laughs>